guys get vaccines, which I guess could happen, what, on the 29th? Something like that, 16 and up. Um, it's, it's not as hard, but this it's like a game. So when the door is open for us 40 plusers, um, man, I spent like the first four days no luck. You like you try everywhere, and I quickly learned here's some good tips. Don't use the official Ohio site from the Ohio Department of Health. It's horrible. I think it was engineered by someone who just doesn't understand how to make an app or anything. So, um, so we eventually just went on all these websites for like Walgreens and CVS and all this stuff, and literally. Kept something in my background for like 24 hours and made it automatic with refresh. And finally, it popped up, and I had to grab the first one there. So sorry, you guys got bumped to Friday. Um, but the vaccine was, was easy. They're really no big deal. Honestly, I didn't even didn't even feel it. I'm not, I'm not making that up. I don't have autism yet, um, so everything seems to be going all right. No side effects at all. So except for the joy of knowing you have dose number one done. Um, so here's our week 11 overview. Um, Let's see, it's, and again, I don't understand this. Something happened uh, to our projector and it's now making everything skew a little bit to the right. I contacted IT, hopefully later today this gets fixed. So no idea what that's all about. So exam two is next week. It's gonna work a little bit differently though. Um, if you've been counting, like, like I'm sure you haven't, we only have four and a half weeks left. So after this week, it's gonna be like a sprint to the finish. Um, so, the content for this exam stops today, or stops with this week, the mental health stuff. So the mental health chapter is the last one that we're gonna do. Um, and it's gonna open up on Monday. So I technically will see you again before the exam. So don't feel like you have to rush into it on Monday or Tuesday. I'll still see you on Wednesday. We'll be talking about new stuff. But if you have questions, if something's missing, feel free. Um, the quiz is going to get posted after this class. I'm going to keep that open actually until Monday. So I didn't say I'm going to change that. It says Sunday. But since you guys didn't get to come here until Friday, I'm going to even talk about this stuff. I'll keep that open until Monday. Um, let's see. In fact, there's, just realized there's another typo in there, too. So I changed a couple things after our class on Monday because I saw how far we went. There's a couple things to absorb. Um, one is, uh, let's see, where, where's the anxiety? So we still have an anxiety disorder. That's a link. Um, someone giving you a talk on anxiety that's not me. Uh, he's just an entertaining guy that knows a lot about psych. And he's going to do an overview of anxiety disorders. Today, we're going to finish our general overview of abnormal psych and also talk about clinical depression, what that looks like. It's a feel-good week, isn't it? It's clinical depression. Um, and then uh, there's another video, which I think you'll really like. So the second part of this is about treatment. What in the world do we do with mental health disorders? Again, one of the hardest things for me in a class like this is to not go into too much detail. Because um, if you didn't know, this is sort of my thing. I mean, I'm, I'm a therapist with a private practice. And the class that I really get into teaching-wise is abnormal psych, the class on mental illness. So my challenge talking about this is to keep it sort of general. And that's a big challenge for me, but we have other stuff to talk about. So if any of this stuff piques your interest, um, definitely look up abnormal psych or our child abnormal psych class, unless you're a senior and it's spring, it's too late to look at anything else up. But there you go. Um, and then there's a there's a video of something that I do here about battling anxiety disorders called the Face Your Fear Project. Um, that's called Facing Your Fears, Battling Anxiety. Um, and then there's a really brief online lecture, like literally like four and a half, five minutes that I put together that kind of sews it all together. So that's what all this is. So just absorb that. And again, you don't need to rush to do the quiz. Uh, you don't need to rush to do the exam. But just know that it's working a little bit differently. It opens up on Monday and closes on Thursday. But I'll remind you. Of course, I'll remind you before I see you. Um, you guys were a little ahead. I didn't realize Team B was kind of inching ahead um, of Team A. But you were. And I, I just want to do a quick overview I honestly don't remember. My brain's a little jumbled. Maybe that's the vaccine. Um, of which ones we got to. Um, but these were the five truisms, right, about mental illnesses. I know we talked about uncommon, right? We, you know, I know we talked about that one, jumping to the end. Um, but look, just real quick, let's just go over nature versus nurture. What did we end up concluding about that? There's only four of you, so it's like a little small intimate conversation. Did we even talk about that? Okay, well, perfect. So, nature versus nurture, and a couple of you were in abnormal psych, so you might know the answer to this question. When it, the, the reason this is up there is 
What causes mental illness? Is it is it nature, genetics, or is it the environment? Yeah. Exactly. So the answer to the first one is it's always somewhere in the middle. There's no mental illness that's 100% genetics. There's no mental illness that's 100% environment. But just so you know, you can choose to write the second part down if you'd like to or not. The, the scale is always tipped slightly differently. There are certainly some mental illnesses that are heavily influenced by genetics, like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And there are others where not so much. So the balance is always different. But it's never either this or either that. We never go to those extremes. Just, I'm going to skip over stigma just for a second. Yes. In the back. Uh, quick question. Can schizophrenia be triggered by like a traumatic event? Absolutely. It absolutely can. In fact, stress is most likely what keeps the genes switched on or kept on that end up causing schizophrenia. And when someone does have schizophrenia, we don't really get into this one in this class, but it's perfectly fine. I think people have a, have a misnomer that someone with schizophrenia is always symptomatic, that they're going to be in some kind of institution, um, which actually really is nothing could be further from the truth. But what when someone, if I had schizophrenia, if I start encountering even a little bit of stress, that's what ignites my symptoms. I might start to become delusional or start to see hallucinations um, or a whole cascade of symptoms that's not focused on. Stress actually brings it on. You're absolutely right. Plasticity. This actually gets talked about um, in the little brief lecture that I, talked, I put up there with the PowerPoint. Plasticity is the idea. This is good news. Plasticity is the idea that your brain can always change no matter how old you get. And in fact, a lot of therapy interventions, if you didn't know, therapy is a lot more than just talking to someone. A lot of therapeutic interventions that have been developed for mental illnesses operate on this principle. The idea that there are parts of your brain we can alter, we can change. This is good news in the term in the world of mental illness. And there's an example of that in that PowerPoint. Matter, degree, we kind of just talked about this with schizophrenia. Mental illnesses are not an all or nothing game just like any other illness you've ever had in your entire life. If you've ever, I mean, this is fun to talk about during a pandemic, but if you've ever had the flu, one year you might just kind of get the flu. Like, oh, yeah, I think I had the flu, but I still went to class. It wasn't that bad. But some years you get the flu, and you're just out, right? Three days in bed, you know, like, oh, my gosh, it's knocked me on my butt. Mental illnesses are the exact same way. Not everyone develops the worst kind of mental illness. In fact, most people don't. There's mild and moderate. We'll talk about depression in a little bit. 80% of people who get depression suffer the mild version. Only 20% get severe depression. Uncommon, just to review, that our number, they're not uncommon at all. At any given time, it's about a quarter of the population probably meets the criteria for some type of mental illness. For others, it's actually even higher. That's just the average. With anxiety disorders, the video that's up there, it's about 33%. So mental illnesses are not common. Uh, now, absolutely, some are more common than others, definitely. But as a whole, mental illnesses are not common at all. And that finally brings us to stigma. And I will actually let Kevin Love do some talking first. Another Kevin. I like, Kevin Love has done a lot of meanings of Cap, so maybe we like him for that. Uh, but he's done a lot of good work um, in the world of mental illnesses. Um, and we actually share a lot in common. Number one, we're both named Kevin. Number two, we actually at some point in our lives both suffered from the same mental illness, panic disorder. Um, and number three, we both feel pretty comfortable talking about that fact in public because there's no shame in that. I mean, I guess I'm a therapist, maybe I'm a little bit biased that I can talk about it. Um, but Kevin Love... He went through kind of a struggle to even open up about it, and he made a choice to do it, and it's helped a tremendous amount of people. And here's a little bit about his story and stigma and how it gets in the way. Then we'll take some more notes. You know, it's interesting when you have an injury, so to speak, and you have a, you know, a knee injury or a hand or, you know, it's an ankle sprain. It's a lot different when you can't see it. And somebody doesn't know what's going on outside the lines. Everybody's going through something. 
success is not immune to depression. So, Kevin, you are now the new face of mental health in the NBA. How does that feel? At first, uh, it was a little scary. I've been from, from you know, suffering with anxiety and depression for a long time and so having my first panic attack on, on November 5th and not really knowing what that meant to, to fast forward and being here now. It's changed my, my frame of mind and it really, I really do believe in, in, in writing my piece that everybody's going through something. So knowing that it doesn't discriminate and knowing that I'm trying to change the stigma, not only for you know people in sports, but all over. I remember talking to my agent and he said, are you sure you want to do this? Because a lot of people are going to talk about this in chat. I don't know if anybody will, but you know, just understand I'm trying to help people. He goes, I get it. If you help one person, you help one kid, it could be absolutely life changing if you're not for that kid. Let's talk about the panic attack you know, because that's when the world got a little glimpse of what was going yeah. on. So take us through what happened that night. Well, it was very scary for me because I, I have always had the anxiety and like a lot of people and you know it's like you know for example you want to go to bed and or you want to go to sleep and you know the big game the next day and so what happens you, you plan your routine you try to go to sleep you get ready and then you pick up the worst things that happened the last 10 years for you so i think it was a combination of, of things that were going on in my life that led up to that point as well as it was a five and seven start and on november 5th uh, i just remember not quite feeling right. Uh, I remember we went through a few plays, there was a timeout, I got to the huddle, and that's when I just, I felt something that I had never felt before. I couldn't, I couldn't catch my breath. And I felt like my mind was completely out, and Ty Lee had said something to me, I told him I'll be right back. I ran to the locker room, I was essentially searching for something that I couldn't find, I didn't know this feeling, and then I just basically uh, ran to our trainer's room, fell on the ground, collapsed, and you know, my heart was jumping out of my chest, and I couldn't get air in my lungs, and you know, essentially was was you know, trying to clear my throat, sticking my hand down my throat, trying to get myself Seriously. air. Yeah, so it was uh, terrifying. It was terrifying. I thought I was having a heart attack. I really felt like I was going to die. This moment. I get like I'm getting hot thinking about it. It was a moment that nobody wants to have, but it was very eye opening. And then going to the hospital. After that, everything checked out, and I was basically thinking to myself, well, what happened? I've now come to a point where I just kind of lay all my cards out on the table and say, this is what you put. And having that freedom of mind is something that I've never really had. It's actually been peace. And sometimes things get worse in order to, to get better. Sometimes there is a rock bottom, but I know that you know, people reaching out for help or talking to someone, it, it does really work. And for so long, I put that off and I didn't do it because that was my, my playbook when I was young was to suppress it and uh, you know, be a man. And, uh, I mean, like the masculinity thing is a, it's a, you know, a kind of misleading in a lot of ways because when that's ingrained in your mind in an early age, you, you feel that way throughout. You know, I wish I would have had the presence of mind earlier on to face these things. But I think everybody has their moment, their aha moment, or that moment where um, you know, they're able to, to come forward with these type of things. So now I'm going to ask you what everyone wants to know. What's LeBron doing during this time? I remember the first thing he said to me after that came out was that when I shook my hand on the back of the bus, he you know, kind of let everybody get out. He said, you, you really helped a lot of people. He helped a lot. Not only a lot of kids, but you know, so that was, that was a special moment, but, you know, I couldn't go a few minutes without another person in that community I talk about coming forward and saying, hey, this, this is my experience and I want to share this with you. So it, it was a way of seeing a lot of people are, are being vulnerable and also, you know, sharing these experiences and, and having that community and saying, we need to, we need to beat down the stigma together. So stigma is still a problem. There's still plenty of guys that have issues, and they don't need to come forward to me or to you, but they do need to get the help. But there are players out there that think you're soft because you did this. They think they are soft. They think everybody that comes forward is soft. What do you say to them? Like, it's such a tired mm -hmm. statement. Like, I've, I put my time in this league. Guys put their time in this league. To be in the NBA, you're not soft. And to come forward with this, it's, 
like I said, that's, that's tired, it's outdated, and it actually, in the end, is probably, for me, it was the best thing I did, and it's only going to help you move forward. And it doesn't just mean basketball players or anyone in sports. This isn't everyone and every human thing. What's the name? Uh, so, and his focus is on battling stigma, and just as an aside, um, he wrote a really wonderful article that's been kind of published and reproduced in a lot of places called Everyone's Going Through Something. Um, and it's really powerful. I recommend reading it if you're interested in this stuff. Or if you know somebody who's going through something that they don't understand or they're worried about talking about it with someone, I would share that article with them. It's actually it's powerful enough that I've, I've known of more than one person who's read it and felt like, all right, I, I can do this. So, but it's all about this. So stigma. Stigma actually impacts the world of mental illness in three really distinct ways. And the first one, there's no particular order to these. The first one has simply has to do with treatment. How long it takes people to actually get treated for a mental illness. I hate, hate going to the dentist. Does anyone else hate going to the dentist? I can't stand it. I just don't, it makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't like it. Nothing personal against my dentist. I just get nervous. But I, there's a girl sitting where you're sitting. She, you're, she's your teammate counterpart. Um, she also really hated, doesn't like going to the dentist. And we asked, if you had a really bad toothache, even if you hate going to the dentist, how long would it take you to actually go to the dentist? I think she said about three days. So, all right, so you put up with it for three days until you finally, all right, I don't like going here, but I would do it. Depression. We've all heard about depression, right? It gets talked about everywhere. How many celebrities have come out and said, yes, I've suffered from depression? It's everywhere. It's like it's actually known as the common cold of mental illness. From the moment people know something's wrong, in other words, they're cognizant of the fact that I'm probably suffering from depression and I probably need help and I should probably go see someone. How long do you think it takes the average person to go from that point A to point B in the therapy room? Yeah. Probably no. About what? Like on average people that do, or like yeah. How long does it take people to seek treatment when they know they need help? I'm guessing the majority don't because they feel like they're one through. You're to... you're probably right, but if they do, what's that time? Yeah, say five to eight years. Eight to nine years. Eight to no, just imagine that for a second. In other words, most people suffer and suffer and suffer and suffer before they ever even walk into a therapy room. Which also shows you a little bit about what some therapists have to deal with. A lot of people that walk into our office, they're like in stage three cancer. In other words, they put up with, they haven't seek, seek help. And it, it's gotten harder, it's gotten more entrenched. It doesn't mean change can't happen, it can. And that analogy isn't perfect either because it implies that if you've waited, help is less likely to be, I guess, effective, and that's actually not true. But it shows you what we're dealing with. A lot of people have been quietly dealing with stuff for nearly a decade before they ever walk in your room. Reason, this. They, they don't want to They don't want to walk in. Actually, you guys have lived with this without maybe not even knowing it. Did you know you get free counseling? You get free therapy. I highly recommend it, because trust me, you'll never get that again. Um, but where is your, if you, let's say you're suffering from something, you need to go see a counselor or a therapist, where do you have to go? Yeah. Well, that, that's temporary. That's only because of this. Like in a typical year. Any ideas? You gotta go to Altman. It's not even on your campus. What? Like, why is it? Anyone? I mean, I know it's a nice suite. I know, and that there's a deal there with Altman. But actually, on most college campuses, the treatment center for mental illness is not even on campus. It's usually off or it's usually off in some kind of like quiet corner. And the reason they do that is because they know if they put it in a place where everyone can see, no one will go. If they put it in a quiet place where it's hidden, students will actually go because they don't want to be seen walking into the mental health clinic because of stigma. The second way it impacts people, treatment is one. The second way it impacts people is We'll just call this labeling and identifying. I have, I'm sure you would never go up to someone 
if they suffered from leukemia and like see them in the morning, give them a high five, like, hey, what's up, leukemia? Like, that's insane. Like, why would you ever do that? You would never call someone by their disease because that's rude and you're not a rude person. But we have very little problem at all saying he's bipolar, you're bipolar, you're depressed. I, I know this sounds just like a, like a grammar thing, and it, but it feels normal to talk like that. I mean, maybe you don't want to talk like that, but we do. We say, oh yeah, he, he's depressed. Yeah. So we label, we literally label people by their diseases they're suffering from, which is insane. It sounds insane on one hand, but for some reason with mental health, we're like, yeah, no big deal. And then on the flip side, what I mean by identify is people with the mental illnesses identify themselves as their diseases. If you have cancer, you don't walk around saying, I'm cancer. That, that's insane. But you're Kevin. You suffer from cancer. I don't have cancer. But when people are depressed or they're suffering from bipolar disorder, they say things like, yes, I'm depressed. I'm schizophrenic. But you're not schizophrenic. You're Josh, who has schizophrenia. And how this affects treatment is a lot of people will walk into your mental health office and you spend a god-awful amount of time in the beginning trying to get them to understand that you are not your disease. You're suffering from something that we can treat. And until you can actually get them over that mental hurdle, there's really nothing you can do. If someone is convinced that they're simply depressed, what, what good is your therapy going to do? Because they see themselves as depression. When you can get them to see it as a disease that they can actually do something about, that's a huge step towards getting treated. Now, not everyone walks in like that, but a lot of people do because that's how we talk. And the third way it impacts people, this is the obvious one. I guess I left this one for last. Is we treat people with mental illnesses in this country really poorly. We treat them differently. We single them out. We think they're damaged goods. That's the easy one. So that I think clears off our, our five tourism. So we've come a long way. This isn't like all negative with regards to stigma. We have absolutely have come a long way, but we've got a really, really long way to go. And still keeping in general before we, we got two more general ideas before we get into depression. The first, this will be easy. Now we're going to talk about older individuals specifically. There's a four myths that really, really perpetuate the world of adulthood and aging with regards to mental illness. We've kind of talked about these. These are just four things to understand when you think about an older person in your life. The first myth is that many people, well, we learned this with all the dementia stuff that we did. Many people think going senile is, is normal, is a normal part of aging, that losing it somehow, well, that's just grandma, uh, that's just grandma, I'm worried about her too, well, that's just, she's 85, that's normal. Actually, it's probably not. Another myth, this goes way, way back to week one in this class, a lot of people think signs of depression or getting sadder or less happy is normal when you're 80 and you're 90. And I hope you've learned by now that's not normal. A lot of people also think, the old dogs, well, this, a lot of people think that therapy isn't effective anymore. One of my favorite clients ever, I, I've got like a short list of clients I'll never forget. An 88-year-old woman, we'll call her Margaret, that's not her name, not that you would ever know her because this is like 15 years ago in Columbus, Ohio. In fact, she's probably not with us. I mean, who knows? Maybe she's still alive, but this is a while ago. She was 88, and she had one arm, and she was suffering from depression, and she hated it, and she wanted to get treated. And I loved her attitude. She was all about, she hated the fact that people thought therapy would work with older people. But I love you. You're fantastic. And guess what? She got better. And she got better just as quickly as someone who's 28 who would have come into the therapy room. So this idea that Old dogs can't learn new tricks with regards to therapy. It's just simply not true. And then last but not least, all of these lead to the last one, which it's pretty self-explanatory. Why, why? Why would you even try to go to therapy if a lot of this stuff is normal? It's not going to help anyway. 
Why even try? It's just pointless. I've even heard some people say, man, therapy takes forever. Oh, like why would you only got like five years left? Why would you spend, spend two of them in therapy? Like two years, like, wow. If you're spent two years in therapy, your therapy is not effective. Like it's not supposed to last that long. But we'll get to that. So before we get to depression, which we will talk about, this is a very boring PowerPoint slide, but during the Kevin Love Stigma, I was doing some work for you guys over here. This is another area of the class where I have to keep it really general, and I have a hard time doing that. In the world of abnormal psych, in that class, we spend a whole week on causes. So just so you're going to get causes in about seven, six or seven minutes. So that's how much we're condensing them. So we're keeping it really general. So we, we already talked about it's not nature, it's not nurture, it's a little bit both. But what are some basic principles that we see in the world of abnormal psych when it comes to what actually makes something happen? Linear causality is the idea that A leads to B. That's why I drew that over there. Linear causality is a wonderful thing. We like it. It makes us feel comfortable. Because it's so damn simple. B would be when bad things happen. We like it when there's an answer. Who doesn't? Of course we want. If we can find the A, we can eliminate the B. It's beautiful. This is why we have a vaccine for COVID-19. We found the A pretty quickly, actually. And if we can just stop that A, we can stop the B. And we can take off the mask and hug each other. A lot of people assume that mental illnesses operate on this principle because a lot of diseases do. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. Not that it's simple to find the A, so this isn't necessarily simplistic, but a lot of diseases operate on this, this principle. They do. In the world of mental health, though, we do not have linear causality at all. So that's the point of actually explaining that, is to tell you it just simply does not exist. And this is the part where a lot of people distance themselves from the world of abnormal psych, because this, this in and of itself makes them feel uncomfortable. Instead of linear causality, we have what we call causal patterns in the world of abnormal psych. Instead of A leading to B, for each mental illness, there's a causal pattern. What we mean by that is there are many A's. There are many causal factors that all go into leading to B. That's why I drew all the A's. So we have many, many, many causal factors that go into any mental illness. There's one thing to add. It's not either here or there. So two things on causal pattern. Let me know if I need to slow down or not catching everything. The first one is, what well, you maybe you already wrote down. Every mental illness has its own unique causal pattern. In other words, the causal factors for depression are not the same causal factors for a phobia. That should make intuitive sense then, right? Why would they, why would they do this? But the second thing about causal patterns, which makes our world of therapy even more interesting, is that every individual's causal pattern for a given mental illness is unique. I'll say that one way, that was kind of a long one. Every person's causal pattern for a given mental illness is unique. In other words, person A walks into my office. They suffer from general anxiety disorder. Okay, they have a causal pattern for that. 18 things in their life that have led to this point. Person B walks in a week later, well, they also suffer from general anxiety disorder. But their causal pattern is going to be unique from person A. Different things happen to them, same outcome, but their causal pattern is different. But there's one thing you know as a therapist. In fact, if you ever do take abnormal psych, at least the book that I use when I teach it, chapter five of our book, whole chapter out of like 14, that's a pretty significant chunk. Chapter five is simply called stress. That's it. That's, that's the title of the chapter. And the reason that's in there, and that's why I plucked it out of there, basically you haven't guessed, there's a common denominator to every single mental illness. Every, no, there's not a mental illness in the book where this doesn't play a role. Stress. Stress is a huge, huge player in the world of mental illness, and it's in the causal pattern for every single one. 
how you're dealing with stress right now in your life, how you're coping with it, is fundamental to preventing mental illness. In fact, I forgot to write something up here. All that time will make Hunter's neck stretch even. Actually, we'll give him a break. Put it in this part. Actually, we'll just, I, don't even, I don't even really need to write this down. Well, you could remember this. Does anyone know? Now, now you're the prosecutor. Uh, does anyone know what's the most common time in a person's life when they're going to get diagnosed with a mental illness? If they're going to get diagnosed. I walked all the way over here, so I will write it down. Even though it's silly. Just two numbers. Any any guesses? When you're tiny, teenagers, young adulthood, maybe it's when you're 50. Well, I'll tell you, it's actually right now. In between the ages of 18 and 25, at least in our country, is when most people get diagnosed with mental illness. This is when I develop panic disorder. Well. There's more to that story. I actually started a lot sooner than that. I just didn't know it. But that's when it got really bad, put that way. And the reason it's 18 to 25, there, this is no mystery. Right now, you are under more stress than you will be in any given time in your life. Especially if you're in college. Yeah. Does it say it's because you stop like, uh, going through like, a degree? You know, like, like, no. Not at all. The what? I feel like like the age, like the age, the just like yeah. Part of like you You could, you could, you absolutely could. But when it's a mental illness, though, it gets so bad that it starts to warm its way into your life and really cause problems. So we do have a lot of kids that get diagnosed, but by far, and this we actually did something on Monday. It took this little stress inventory. Um, but just think about all the manufactured stressors right now that are in your life, from the tests, the quizzes, the exams, the papers, to can I find a job, am I going to find a spouse, all the stuff that's going on right now. You're in the biggest transition that you'll probably ever be. It doesn't mean later in life stress doesn't happen. Of course it's going to happen. But for an extended period of time, stress is just weighing down. Which actually isn't necessarily a bad thing. A lot of people take a stress inventory and they get completely freaked out. It's like, oh my gosh, look at my number and look what it says at the bottom. It says I'm going to have a crisis. It's not about how much stress you're under. It's just simply what you're doing with it. How do you deal with it? And if you have a way of coping with it, you're fine. There's actually relatively nothing to be scared about. Last but not least, uh, when it comes to causal factors, because of this, because of stress's role in the world of mental illness, in general, all mental illnesses follow something called the diathesis stress model. Anyone know what the word diathesis means? This is not a, this isn't necessarily a mental health term. It's just a general medical term, actually. What kind of stuff runs in your family? Anything? Heart disease? <laughs> by putting you on the spot. High cholesterol. Yeah. Maybe cholesterol. You have a diathesis for cholesterol problems. Congratulations. That's all diathesis means. Diathesis is just a general term that means your genetic susceptibility because of stuff, crap, that right? we all have stuff. The stuff that everyone's family treats. Maybe it's, hopefully it's not that something like Alzheimer's, but maybe it is. Maybe dementia runs in your family. Maybe high cholesterol does. Maybe it's obesity. Maybe it's divorce. I'm kidding. I mean, actually, I'm not kidding. That's actually a thing. So just genetic susceptibility. Mental illnesses are no different. So just think for a moment about people that you know, grandparents, uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters. There's typically most people, now not everyone does, and bless their hearts, but a lot of people, most people that I've met, have some type of mental illness that runs in their family. For myself, it happens to be anxiety disorders. I'm surrounded. People in my dad's family tree and people in my mom's family tree both suffer from anxiety disorders. So my diathesis for anxiety disorders is really high. Luckily, there's no schizophrenia or depression or anything like that. So that's really not even on the radar. What this means for me is that it doesn't take a lot of stress 
to push my brain to the point where I'm going to start feeling the effects of anxiety, where it could produce an anxiety disorder. So the greater the diathesis, here's the point to this, the greater your diathesis, the less stress in your life it's going to take to manifest symptoms. Because I don't have diathesis for depression, does that mean I'm immune to it? Of course not, because we haven't developed a vaccine for that. Wouldn't that be great? A mental health vaccine. I don't even know what that would look like. But what that means is it would take a extreme amount of stress for that to manifest itself. Whereas person B, if they had a lot of depression in their family tree, they actually probably wouldn't take them very much stress. I mean, it's still a lot, but less than someone with less diathesis. Does that make sense? So lots of diathesis, very little stress to push you over the edge. Because you have so much genetic susceptibility. What that means is people with really strong diathesis just need to make you sometimes some lifestyle changes to keep things under wraps. No different than people with high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure in your family, all right, then you, unfortunately, whatever, you probably have to be a little more careful about what you eat, how much you exercise, than the person B over there, the jerk with no high blood pressure, can eat whatever the hell he wants, and he's still fine. What's happening? Kind of well, don't worry, because he's got something else going on. So the diathesis stress model. Woo! All right, we did a week. There's a lot more to that. Which brings us to the mental illness that we'll, we'll talk about today. Good news, I can already see that we're going to get out of here a little bit early today. Because you guys were ahead of the game. Congratulations. Because everything else is, is sort of online. So depression and suicide. I actually ended up deciding to table suicide. I think I found a good place for that, actually closer to the end of the course. Not that I'm going to end the course talking about suicide. But one of the last things we'll talk about in this course is well-being. Um, and after we brought it up on Monday, we actually didn't even really get into it. And I kind of sat back and thought, ah, I have a better idea for this. So what we're going to talk about is something called major depressive disorder, so it's, or otherwise known as depression. But technically, MDD is the clinical name. And remember, as we talk about this, this comes in mild, moderate, and severe forms. But before we get into depression, where we actually define it and talk about the symptoms and what it is, don't necessarily need to write this down. I just want to say this out loud, just in case some people are not aware, and that's perfectly fine. Mental illnesses are categorized into different categories. Interesting way of saying that. We have what are known as the mood disorders. These are things like depression and bipolar disorder. We have the anxiety disorders, which include things like OCD, phobias. We have the psychotic disorders, which include things like schizophrenia, and in some cases, bipolar, actually. Uh, we have the eating disorders, which is pretty important. In other words, there's all these different categories of mental illnesses. If something is in a category with something else, what that means is it has common causal factors and also common pathways to treatment. Doesn't mean they're identical. So they have something in common. So depression is a mood disorder. It's not an emotional disorder. And this is an important kind of distinction to make right off the bat. There are three really important, don't you love these little lists of three things like that we always trickle in here. So there's three really important distinctions between emotions and moods to help you understand why it's not an emotional disorder. They're all interrelated to each other. What's what? Maybe you've never thought about this. It's probably words that we use interchangeably. But what are the differences between emotions and moods? Anybody? <laughs> I said I say that was so with such enthusiasm. Oh, guys. Yes. That's that's absolutely one of them. Moods last a really long time, relative to emotions. You could be in a bad mood for days. 
the deal with mood disorders is it's like you get stuck for a god awful long time. So yeah, but moods in general, not every mood is a mood disorder, but moods last a really long time. You wake up in a bad mood, you can still be in a bad mood at nine o'clock. Whereas emotions, very quick. You go, oh, I laughed, now I'm done. Now I'm back to my bad mood. The second one is, well, kind of what I just said. Emotions are reactions to things, stimuli in the environment. You see something, you hear something, you experience something, boom, you feel an emotion. Moods are not like that. Moods are like the undercurrent in the ocean. Emotions are like the waves on top. You can mess with the waves, but you can't do anything about the current that's going underneath. And because of those first two, leads us to our last one. Emotions are really easy to manipulate and change. Moods are not so easy to manipulate and change. Doesn't mean you can't change them, but it takes a lot more effort. Because they last longer and they're not necessarily reaction to things. You can go to a movie and if, oh my god, I love that movie. In an hour I felt happy and I was sad and I was jealous and I was so angry. And now I'm hopeful. <laughs> right? Well, in an hour you can experience the whole rainbow of emotion. But you're probably still in the same mood that you were when you walked in the door. So those are some differences. So that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with mood. So some kind of disturbance in someone's mood. So let's talk about a major depressed mood state. Not a fun place to be. In fact, again, you don't need to write this down, but just to get it out, there's we have something known as the mood spectrum. There's highs that you can get to, and then there's lows that you can go to. And in the middle is this nice mood state that you're probably in right now called euthymia. And you don't need to write that down. But euthymia is in the middle, and it just means... There's nothing really, it's just neutral, benign. I don't really feel necessarily up and excited and agitated. And I'm not necessarily feeling down and low and low. You're just, ooh, nice, right, right in the middle. And that's probably subjective to some degree. But let's, what we're talking about is the lowest of the low on the mood spectrum. The interesting thing is you've probably been there. Most human beings that I know have probably been there. If you haven't, you've lived a pretty stress-free life to this point, but I'm assuming with at least 21 laps around the sun, you've probably found yourself in a depressed mood state. That doesn't mean you have depression, and that doesn't mean you have depression, because we've all been there. But let's talk about it. So there are two. The reason I wrote one and then two is there are two what we call the hallmark symptoms of a major depressed mood state. In other words, to some degree, these two are almost ever present for someone who's currently in a major depressed mood state. So just, and like, this isn't a fun thing to do, but think about the last time you went through something really, really, really bad. Maybe you're on the bad end of a breakup, those first 24 hours or longer. Or you were at a funeral, someone passed away. What, what was those first days? What, what was it like? Again, not a fun thing to think about, but what do you suppose these first the hallmark symptoms are? And you've all, well, you've seen commercials for antidepressants. They kind of show these things to you. What do we, what is depression? Yeah. I sort of think the commercial, like, the shadow, like, dragging around. And it's like, you, yeah. know, like, you can't think of like, a word for it. It's just, like, tired. We're getting there. That's actually underneath, that's not hallmark symptoms, but. Are people with depression sad? No. That's, that's a big myth about depression. In fact, I got a lot of tissues in my office. People that come in with major depression are not the most frequent users of those tissues. But we have this idea that depression means you're walking around sad. Right? This is, you see this in the commercials. It's always like a 40-year-old woman looking out the window. It's black and white. It's raining. There's a dog in the background with a leash. Hasn't been walked in weeks. Right? That's, and she's like, maybe there's a tear, and she just looks so freaking sad. But what is sadness? Is it an emotion or a mood? It's an emotion. We're not talking about an emotional disorder. Like, you don't walk around with prolonged sadness. But that's kind of how it gets represented, like a little Eeyore, right? In fact, people use that sometimes as an analogy. So sad. It doesn't mean you're sad, but it does mean a world... A word 
of this dysphoria. Now, you, you don't walk around sad the entire time, but you probably are experiencing, to some degree, a dysphoric state. Anyone have any idea what this is? The best analogy I can think of is, again, not something fun to think about, is at a funeral. Um, at least the ones that I've been to. Most people, most of the time at a funeral, are not crying. That doesn't mean there's usually some people, right, somewhere are crying. But for the most part, like, let's say you go, have you ever been to a showing, like, right, the stuff that happens before the actual funeral service? These are always hard because the family's usually there, right? It's like the last time you can say goodbye. It's like the casual stuff that happens before the service. When you go to those things, most people are pretty calm, right? And they're, they're kind of, and sometimes you're even shocked at how okay some people are. However, it doesn't take much to go from I'm okay, I'm holding it together, to I'm a complete train wreck and I'm crying in the corner, right? That's a dysphoric mood state. So what the dysphoria means is you're highly susceptible to extreme bouts of sadness. Think of it like a tornado watch, right? Conditions right now are ripe for a tornado. Doesn't mean we're going to have one. Right? Think about the last time you went through something hard, right? You, you're not walking around crying all the time. But you're you're very susceptible to it. You could watch the right commercial. Like, oh my god, because you're in this state. It's like it's like this thin layer of ice between I'm holding it together and I'm an absolute wreck. And that's what a dysphoric, dysphoric state is. However, this actually isn't the most common thing that you see. At least from a clinical standpoint, it's the second one. I can't spell. I can't. I can't talk out loud and spell at the same time. So I don't know why. I was actually a seventh grade Melody champion at my school, which none of you would believe. I can't even write correctly. Anhedonia is actually the one that really sticks out to you as a therapist or as a, as a person suffering from this. Actually, anhedonia, at least from clients' mouths, anhedonia is the worst part about suffering from depression. What the heck is anhedonia? Not well, that could be related to it. You could, you could lose interest because of anhedonia. Anhedonia is the lack of an ability to experience pleasurable emotion. So you're right, because that thing that you enjoy doing doesn't bring the same joy that it did. Let's say you really like going to Cedar Point. I really like going to Cedar Point because I like the way it makes me feel when I'm there. If you're suffering from anhedonia, let's say you really like amusement parks. Great, who doesn't get excited? And they get up in the morning to go. Imagine going to an amusement park and having the same emotional connection to that as going to the library or going to study hall. Oh, yay. Okay, we're at Cedar Point. Yay. That's what, and that's what makes depression suck so much because all the stuff you used to enjoy in life you can still do it, it just doesn't do anything for you. It's like all the wires connected to pleasure have been ripped out in your brain. And in fact, in a way they are. But I, there's no time to get into that. So anhedonia. Here's something I mentioned on Monday, though, that I just throw out. The, the, the deal with anhedonia, though, and this is what makes depression hard to see. It may be in a roommate or in a friend or a loved one. People that actually suffer from depression are really, really good at faking it. In other words, they can go to a party and pretend they're having a good time. They can put on, we call it the mask of sanity. So there could be people that you know every day currently suffering from depression, and you would never know because they don't want to talk about it. And sometimes what happens is they take a class like Abnormal Psych, and they realize, oh my gosh, what I'm going through isn't normal. That's what keeps happening. Now, if it's a severe case, you're, you're probably not going to be able to fake it. But there's lots of people with mild depression who are able to just kind of hack it and keep going to classes and deal with stuff. You ever heard that addicts are the best liars, which is actually probably true? Well, people with depression are some of the best actors I've ever met in my entire life because they can pretend to not have it. And people will... Huh. You can't be depressed, right? How many stories do we hear about people who take their own lives and people are like, oh my God, I had no idea. 
Because you don't know. You have no idea what they're suffering from on the inside. So we got two hallmark symptoms, and then we got three other. There's this, there's a much longer list, trust me, but these are the three most common ones that you see clinically. So accompanying symptoms of depression. You've got social withdrawal. Again, something people can fake. But to varying degrees, people just don't feel like being around others. They would, they'd rather be alone. So they might stop picking up the phone. They might stop going out for weeks. Like, where's Judy then? I don't know. Have you heard from Judy? No, I have not. Last week, we talked about low T. Today, we're talking about low E. So low energy. That's what this one stands for. By low energy, we mean a complete... We'll put it this, you've all had days, right? I had one of them this morning. I did not want to get out of bed. Just, oh my God, look out the window, it's dark, it's windy, like, I'm just screw it. I just want to stay in bed, shut off the lights. Unfortunately, now I have children and a job that I like. So I found the willpower to get up, get in the shower, put on some clothes and come to work. Okay, I certainly don't suffer from depression because people that do, what we mean really by energy is you just can't even start the engine. You have eight things to do, and it's not because you're procrastinating. It's not because you're willingly putting things off. You just can't do it. You can't find the motivation to do even simple things, which is why some people with really bad depressions won't even, they won't leave the house for months because they're not brushing their teeth. They're not taking care of themselves. This, by the way, is why postpartum depression is such a big deal because this can interfere with taking care of a child. It's a lot of work. And if you don't, if you're suffering from major depression, you don't have the energy to do that work. And then you start hating yourself because you know you're not taking care of the kid. And you feel like an evil person, but you're really not. People like Tom Cruise tell you that postpartum depression doesn't exist. It makes you feel even worse. It's a whole vicious cycle. So low E is a thing. And then one thing people often don't think about with depression is the cognitive impact. You can't concentrate. You can't keep things together. You have a more difficult time learning and remembering things, so your academics just suck. You want to study, but you can't. And even when you do study, you're not retaining anything because you can't concentrate. Doesn't depression sound enjoyable? No, it does not. So this, but the thing is, right? So just again, the reason I use that analogy is. You've probably all been there. If something really terrible in your life happens, this happens. You don't feel like going out. You don't feel like doing anything. You can't concentrate. Nothing is fun. I'm really sad. I get my, I'm, I'm susceptible to extreme bouts of sadness, but it starts to go away, right? You break up with Johnny or whoever. The first few days, you might even tell yourself things like it's never going to get any better. Oh my God, life, life is over. It's dark. But guess what happens? A week goes by, it's a little better. Another week goes by, things are better. Six months later, you look back and you're like, huh, I guess things got better. You can't even really explain how, but you just felt. You just, in other words, you went from low back to normal. It was this gradual, we'll get you back to you, thymi. That's life. Bad things happen, you go down, you go back up. People that suffer, however, from major depression get stuck. So think of that worst day after the funeral or after someone passes away or after the breakup. Maybe you have normal sight. Maybe you remember this. How long does a major depressed mood, if it's depression, how long does this last on average? And we call this a major depressive episode. Panic attacks last about 20 minutes. That's not so Kevin Love, what he dealt with, he used 20 minutes to a half hour of that suffering. <clears throat> Not fun, but it's, it's a half hour. How long does this last, on average, if it's depression? Any guesses? If you're guessing six to nine months, you're right. So the first by the numbers, six to nine months. Oh, my God. Uh, just imagine the, the damage to a life that could be done with one bout of depression. I mean, the good news is it does remit, but if it starts today, you're looking at September until you, when you might start feeling better. Now, are there things we can do during that span to help you? Absolutely. There are even things you can do to help pull yourself out of this. 
quicker than six to nine months. But if you just do nothing, in six to nine months, you'll reemerge from your house and you'll probably feel normal. But this is why people go to therapy to help themselves. And they take antidepressants to help themselves. So during this time, they can function. So that's what the therapy and antidepressants do, is they help, just like when you have a cold, you, what do you take? Dayquil, right? You, you're still, you're not like, you're not fixing anything, but you're taking stuff so that you can function and feel normal while the stuff is happening. And then it goes away, and you don't longer need to take the Dayquil and things like that. So the first number, scary, six to nine months. The second number is, with you, well, and me, I'm still including this, not that old yet. So in, a, in normal adulthood, anxiety disorders are the number one mental illness, most common. In fact, if you caught the blurb, it's about 30%. Whereas depression, it's up there. It's like 15 to 17%. So it's still very common in just on average. But when we get into older adulthood, so by older adulthood, I mean 65 plus. So retirement, older age, moving into Copeland Oaks, et cetera, et cetera. When we get up there, anxiety disorders are actually no longer very common at all. And it gets replaced by major depressive disorders. So this is, in fact, this is why I thought this is the one that I would talk about a lot. Major depressive disorder is, unfortunately, the most common mental illness that we know of in older age. It's about 20%, just in general, about 20% of our older population suffers from some form of depression. But again, here's one of the problems of thinking this is normal and there's nothing you can do about it, interfere. And if we look at people in places like a facility, like a nursing home, that number shoots to about 35%. So just in general, the older population, this is the number one mental health Mental illness, most common. But if we look into facilities, it gets even more common. One, three, four, five, and there's five really big reasons why, and they're up there, they're just kind of shortened. So what? What is it about this population? I mean, we can probably come up with some things on our own, right? But these are the ones that we really know about that really play a role. So the causal pattern for the major depressive disorder includes some unique things to it that you just don't see in 20-year-olds. The first is mobility issues. This isn't fun. What if you're someone who suffers from some type of significant mobility issue? I used to work at a running store, and one of the owners of the store, was he was getting older, great runner in his prime, but he was in his 60s, late 60s, and he had to have a double hip replacement which actually had nothing to do with running. It was like a genetic thing that ran in his family. Someone went from being, I could walk across my store to now I'm using a walker. Imagine being 69, he's using a walker. He actually slipped into a major depressive episode. So mobility issues, pain. Now this isn't something that's necessarily common, but there are disorders of older age, like arthritis, et cetera, that can make you live in some type of chronic pain. That's something a lot of 20 year olds don't have to deal with. Loss, this is inevitable. Now, we all deal with it differently, but it's unavoidable. The older you get, the more loss you experience. My wife's grandma, who's still alive, it's, it's interesting. Great grandmas now are very common. I never even knew my great grandmother, but our daughters like have this awesome relationship with great, they're every, it's weird. Great grandmothers now are everywhere. One of the great benefits of living longer. But she just lost three siblings in two weeks, a brother and two sisters, bam, 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 just like that. Like, how do you, whoa, how do you cope with that? On top of friends that she's lost for, for over the past three years. Like, so you're just bombarded with loss after loss. I guess kind of wondering, like, well, when does my ticket get punched? Like, it's, all these people are exiting. Impairments, cognitive impairments specifically. If it does happen to you, if you do start developing maybe some form of dementia, Again, that's something a lot of 20-year-olds don't have to deal with. And then finally, if you are an in institution, we know that's a huge risk factor. The number is almost double. But that's the main deal with this is just the isolation.
Not to mention that. If there's time, we'll get to this in this class. But with only four and a half weeks, I'm not sure if we'll be able to squeeze it in. Um, if you didn't know, facilities that older individuals live in vary a lot. There are some that are wonderful. Oakland Oaks is like a paradise in terms of a place to live when you're older. But if there actually is no federal regulation for facilities for aging adults. And some of them are nightmarish, to put it like. So depending on where someone ends up, could certainly play a role. Some are great. Some might do an excellent job. Some not so much. But we know it plays a role. And that, that's it. I actually didn't get out early. I don't know why. I just kept talking, I guess. So there's other stuff to absorb. Um, but again, I'll, I'll postpone that quiz until Monday. Because it just seems cruel to say, hey, do it by Sunday. I see you guys just got here. So I'll push that out till Monday. And don't forget, Monday through Thursday, it, it works just the way the first one did, just different questions. But that's it. So some stuff on anxiety disorders. This, again, it's just general. What that one video does, it's not me talking, it's someone else. Um, but it's, it's kind of, there's like animations. It's like, yay, there's pictures to see. Um, it's just like a literally a general overview of the different anxiety disorders that are out there. Um, and I sort of take over from there. If you have any questions, just let me know. I'm going to end. I wonder if some people just forgot.